So guys, uh, I'll be, I'll obviously start with a two minute spiel about myself. Um, public speaking is not really my forte, I'd much rather be on the court, but it's something that I need to get better at, better at and it's something that I'm enjoying kind of taking the challenge I'm doing. So just trying to, to get out there. So if I miss anything or um, make you uncomfortable, then just go with it. Uh, it's okay, it's, it's like a you know, train wreck here. Can't stop watching. Um, and for me, I think too, it's, it's kind of interesting to, to be here and start mixing with coaches and standing in front of coaches. You know, I've been coaching for all of, probably two minutes compared to a lot of you guys. And so the stuff that I talk about and the stuff that I ask you guys about really comes from a player experience um, and now in the, in the process of transforming that into, into a coach. So that's where a lot of my information comes from. So if, you know, it might not be aligned with what you guys kind of think. Uh, it might be fairly different, but I guess that's why we kind of call it a Q&A and a bit of a discussion so that we can kind of learn off each other and, and brainstorm some, some stuff and we passed this through Lotto during the week and he said we'll, we'll look to try and develop it over the next couple of years um, as it becomes a really important topic. And Australian basketball, Australian sport is developing female athletes. Um, I played for, for almost 20 years played with Rach down here uh, in Sydney for a few years, um, played overseas for the national team, junior national team, uh, here, there and everywhere. So domestically had a, a fair crack and, um, and loved it. So I think if I still could be playing, I probably would be. Um, but as the universe kind of works out, it's, it's pushed me towards coaching and starting to, to really, really enjoy it and really, really get, get amongst it. So I'm coaching instead of excellence on the women's program. Um, and been coaching there since the end of last year and probably, you know, technically coaching for the so still, uh, still getting up there. So Sean asked me to talk about developing female athletes and kind of sat down and had a bit of a think about putting pen to paper this week around what I believe, um, also what I've observed a little bit uh, and then uh, what we're currently in uh, at the COE. And these are just broad topics, so we'll probably bring one up, um, have a little bit of a, don't want to go death by PowerPoint, and then let's just have a discussion around, around it. So personal beliefs. So I've only got four of these, so, so you know what's coming up. So honestly believe that we have to create a positive environment for our female athletes. Okay, so young people have a lot to choose from, this is all the information you guys know. Um, it's important that we provide a, a positive and enjoyable environment. Um, people usually excel when they, they enjoy what they do and I'm trying to encourage enthusiasm. So for me that, that's pretty easy. Um, you know, I, I kind of enjoy, enjoy the young kids, they've got a fair bit of humour. Um, they kind of let you know what they, they want to do so they kind of guide you that way as long as you're willing to, to kind of go with them and, and create that environment and put some variety and stuff. There. Does anyone have any questions or, or thoughts about how they kind of stuff? Any kind of tricks to the trade? Christian, how do you balance that between making fun and obviously you're setting up a serious environment and how do you expect that balance in the environment? We're, we're pretty lucky this year because we get access to them all the time. So we'll have our, our sessions and then we'll have fun day or we'll put on a schedule surprise day and we'll run, do different things. So on Monday, coming up we've got a session we're just going to have a team's challenge race so we're going to give them a task give them three teams um, sorry task sheet and they've got to go out and the first team back uh, that completes it I don't know if you have to say kind of they got there's a little bit of an entry fee um, and if they win they get to maintain it if not then it goes to a pool where we can, we can all, uh, do a team function at the end of the season but stuff like on on the task is Tasha is making a little staff member a cup of coffee, um, make 93s, make add, 8 out of 10 free throws each, um, write COE on the court, not using pens or paper, so they've got to use other materials, so for example they can choose chairs, they can choose their bodies, um, lots of stuff like that and they've got to tick them off and then the first team back wins. So mixing it up like that, um, I think variety is a big thing. So who are the judges of the contest and what's the uh, appeal mechanism? Judges of the... <laughs> so, this no, is a coach well, myself. No, it would not be committed yes. at all. <laughs> <laughs> if you 
we're pretty lucky now. We've, we've um, and I think you, you lead by example a little bit. So all this stuff is for me at this point. You lead by example, but um, we've got to a point now where I believe they won't cheat. I believe they won't. Whether they do or not, I don't know. So we we talk about you know cheaters never prosper. You're only cheating yourself. Don't be a cheat. Um, don't be a sneaky cheat. Um, and, and they kind of get that and they're, they're bought into that. So I think we can trust them to a point, but then there'll be an assistant coach in, in one space and I'll be in the other space. And it's just that, that fake, what do you call it, fake supervision. Yeah. So yeah, you've got to do 150 skips, we're not gonna stand there and count them like they do in CrossFit. So 150 and then they've got to get it ticked off by us. So they might, they might go 142, but we'll tick it off. But if we're kind of standing there watching them, um, they're more likely to, to self-regulate than do it themselves. So variety, I think, sorry, the good thing about variety and, and uh, what, what you do to mix it up or, is use your imagination. Okay, uh, I think basketball has turned back into being a lot about science and less about art. And my personal belief is that basketball, you can mesh both, and it's important to mesh both, but basketball should be an art form. It should be magical, creative, explorative. Um, encourage enthusiasm. I'd just be interested in, you know, it's one of your three positive uh, statements there. What would you, would you give us a, 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 an example of how you do that with your girls um, currently and maybe with a, a younger under 12, under 14 team? Because they may look different. Yeah. With our girls right now, and we had this conversation this morning, this morning I'm sure most of you have probably already done this, is using resources. So has everyone seen the Gino Ariamo clip about character? Yeah. It's flashing around on Facebook at the moment. Um, it's only two and a half minutes. If you get an opportunity, go, go have a quick watch. So we grabbed that and like most of you guys have seen it, it was like, that's brilliant. It's black and white. Um, it's emotive. So we showed it to the girls. Bring your notebooks. We have YouTube day. So we have YouTube, um, YouTube day coming in. We put it on the big screen bring your notebooks and we watch it. We don't say anything, watch it. Guys, you want to watch it again? They normally, if it's a short clip, they'll normally say yes. Watch it again. Funnily enough, they're frantically writing notes, okay, on what resonates with them. Uh, and then we, we spend time, because uh, you know, just like me, don't want public speaking, we spend time as a group. Okay, you've got 30 seconds, just 30 seconds. You can do anything for 30 seconds. What, what resonates with you and just communicate that. So one thing out of absorb information, and also being able to keep it that's really important. So, um, and that clip especially was about enthusiasm. So don't be the cool kid. You know, don't be the cool kid that doesn't get better because you're being cool. Um, and he basically says, you know, there's a premium on body language. You know, a lot of body language comes from trying to be cool or attitude or you know bits and pieces. And he says, if he looks down the edge of the, the end of the bench and, and you're not engaged, you don't get in ever. And so I think those messages from a different voice um, is a really good way uh, to, to help the kids. Um, and it's also not something then that we're talking at them, so that's something that they can take ownership of and feel empowered. Um, with young kids, be that person. Be that enthusiastic person. So go out, muck around, um, joke, you know, put the ball in your hand. Be enthusiastic. They'll pick up on your vibe. If you say it to a 12 year old, be enthusiastic, they'll be like, what is enthusiastic? So I think be that person is probably the difference. With the older kids, you need to engage this a little bit more. Hopefully, I'm not putting the spot here, but it's, we, we deal with something similar where, uh, similar problem, but I guess we've got them for one or two sessions a week. Do you have any tips to how to balance that with the then? switching on and have to be serious now. Because yeah. something we try and be positive but then getting them, bringing them back, back in, I guess, is, yeah. is difficult sometimes. Everyone here. So just about that balance between focus and having fun. And it's, it's great. On Thursday night, they're being flat. Our girls have been flat all week. They had a 40-point win in the sea ball on Sunday. And I think they think they're, you know, they're world beaters at the moment. So the next couple of days, they hit, hit a new gym, gym program. They're being flat. So Tuesday was drapey, uh, Wednesday was a slog, and then Thursday we just wanted to take the shackles off and just make it fun. And they were typical teenage girls, they were giddy and giggly, and once teenage girls start giggling, you can't stop. And so a bunch of them lose focus. And I think, for me, I'm still learning, um, 
but creating an environment where they can learn uh, how to be focused whilst having fun. So if we just go, all right, can, and we, we've all said this, haven't we? We've all heard it. Have fun, but be focused. You know, and if you keep saying it to them, they don't really get it unless they get an opportunity to do it. So sometimes they have to go to the extreme to know how far that is, or, or to know what not to do. So we kind of let them go a little bit. We spoke to them about it. You know, how do you maintain focus? Um, be aware that you know you may be able to maintain focus even though you're you're, you're hacking up, but your team might might not be able to. So just that awareness. So you're in that situation now. What's going on? Um, I think you give them a few opportunities of that, and then you start to pull the reins in a little bit, but allowing them to see where the, the spectrum is. Lily, sometimes just to uh, expand the conversation a little bit, sometimes fun isn't interpretation of fun isn't giggle, giggle, laugh, that sort of fun. It could be fun through creating competition in drills, creating competition in groups, um, and so the, the enjoyment which matches the fun comes from that as well. So you mix and match those sorts of things you know, to get a good point. Um, is, is an interesting uh, dynamic as well, because you can have a lot of fun in competitive shooting drills uh, in two on two, three on threes. So the fun that is, is, is different sorts of fun. It depends on whether you want to, want to lighten the mood or whether you want to create enjoyment and fun through competition, through times, through scores, through your scavenger hunts or whatever you uh, here's a question back to you guys. You, is that a difference in the, uh, obviously I see basketball players, not so much genders, but, but I don't see boys giggling and gurning as much. I don't know if that's a boy thing to giggle and gurn. So I, I wonder if that's a thing with female players is they need both. So they need to giggle, but then how do we create that enjoyment through competition? Yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, I've coached both as well. And, uh, it's been a bit of both in both. The guys don't giggle as such, but they'll they'll, yeah, they'll fool around and have you and talk, you know, crash and go on and all that sort of stuff and, and then get back into it. It's, it's a different sort of um, a competitive enjoyment. I think, I think there's a need for both. Because you can't, if it's a 10 month or 8 month or 6 month season, you can't be tuned in all the way along. Otherwise, and also, they've got to let, as you were saying earlier, they've got to let, they have to see you as being able to have fun and relax and make it quick. And then when it's time to write it, it's, uh, we're going to really focus on this now, tune back in. So I think it's a situation. I think both need both. Absolutely. And it comes back to the enthusiasm we'll talk about later. Is enthusiasm, and we've said it in many other uh, different words, is a huge part of retention in female sport. It's fun. Sorry, before we go on from this point, I just wanted to add that I think through everything that we've just spoken about, what <coughs> is most important is that it gives girls in particular confidence. Okay, so, and I think that's a really big thing, probably separates the, the genders a little bit. But it's really interesting that we can place so much importance on the positivity about our game because for girls, that's what they, they need, I think. Yeah. Kind of just to show us hands who kind of feels like they're all over this in their coaching just, or, or thinks it's important. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just an interesting one because, you know, and I'm saying this from a coach that, that I've seen a lot of coaches around. I grew up playing with a lot of coaches and went to overseas and there was a lot of work hard, stay focused, get your job done and not a whole lot of, you know, positive fun. Just, just be better, just do it. Just get on with the job. So just think, wondering how important that kind of is on the ground. Mr. Uh, last night, Cheryl Chambers uh, actually talked about this very thing. And uh, anybody that has seen the Flames play this last season would have um, observed um, almost every game. They had some you know, games where they had players out early, so they lost some games. Um, but the, the, the single most thing was that Cheryl can change how she talked to the players. My observation, I wasn't quite close, but you could see. And and they all were enjoying what they were doing. And they very much were, on every game, there was somebody else that seemed to have the confidence, which is what they are saying, the confidence to be able to step up because Leilani may not have been putting the ball in the hole, but was doing something else. So I think, I, you know, and I, 
I applaud the fact that her peers gave her that um, coach of the year because that's what I saw, that all of a sudden we saw a team that I've supported forever enjoying themselves, having fun and being successful. So they they really hit every tick that you needed them to hit, but it, I think it was about being positive, enjoying and having fun. Which is an interesting point. You probably, in, in only my opinion, the two teams that made that grand final would probably be the two teams that enjoyed what they did the most throughout the year. Like Demi and I were pretty, you know, they yes. enjoy what they do, they enjoy each other. Yep. And probably so the same thing as well, which is goes to show the, you know, the effect that it has on um, performance and confidence. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, fair. So, uh, this is something that we've dealt with a bit over the last couple of months. And, uh, so I won't go into details around that, but it's it's given me a good insight into what I think about fair and some of the conversations we had um, over the last couple of months and some of the just the one-liners that I got from people were um, let's let's just lay out you know some kids did some things wrong okay it happens every day you guys have had kids that step out of line um, you know rock up to practice late um, what's the other stuff that kids do that. Not show up at all. Not show up at all. Yeah. Yeah. Don't communicate effectively. Um, list can go on. And somebody said to me, should we just not do anything about it? And I knew where they were coming from because we're, and obviously we're dealing with the lead kids. I knew where they were coming from and it was about should we not jeopardize their possible futures because they made a, a teenage mistake. And it just got me thinking about my values and my morals. And for me, and we spoke to the girls about this, is it's really important to keep the world the right way up. Okay, wrong is wrong, right is right. That's okay. Okay, um, and that from that there will be natural consequences. So if you don't do gym program, um, then you probably won't get stronger, and you probably won't be as good basketball player as you want to be. Okay, that's a natural consequence. We don't have to implement that. Or well, there's implemented consequences, which. Um, you know, you, you don't rock up to, to practice and you don't get to play in the weekend. So that's just a, a, the way that life works. And I think it's really, really important for young females is to keep the world the right way up. Um, same as if, and if they see if they see a teammate that doesn't get reprimanded, or if they see a coach that doesn't get reprimanded, or whatever it might be, then all of a sudden nothing's the right way up and, well, there's no rules. I can do whatever I like. And I think it's really, really important because we're not just developing young players, we're developing young people that this is important, this is a life skill, and it's okay to make mistakes, absolutely. I think we need to give them the space to make mistakes um, and to be honest and accountable, uh, and then just to live with those consequences. Okay? And you'll find, and this is a beautiful thing that we've found with the, the girls, is if you challenge them uh, and you're right, if you're fair, they will accept it, they will respond. It doesn't get any louder. Who can't, sorry, who can't hear me? It gets <laughs> okay, close that. that's all right. <laughs> okay, all right, I'll speak louder. Um, use adversity to become a motivator. So this sometimes comes from that, you know, you muck up or something doesn't happen that you want in life. Use it to become a motivator. I was a part of this course the last couple of weeks, oh, sorry, the last couple of years, and in one of the courses, one of the week courses, um, we spoke about the Olympic gold medals from London. It was like seven, six or seven. Um, Australian gold medals, so not, not too many, and we went back and we had a look at how many of those athletes that won gold had overcome some significant adversity, and it was something like five, five or six out of those seven gold medals had overcome significant adversity um, to get to that point. So whether there's a correlation or not, um, you actually pretty much, and you find it in other examples as well, is that adversity can be a great motivator um, and can be a great, a great help finding yourself and, and skills and, and going on to, to you know, maximizing your potential. Um, and this one could be a conversation we had for ages, so we don't need to really get into a perception of opportunities. Change in need versus greed over, over the years. I know that Lorraine would have a, a few thoughts on this, but just the shift um, in what's changed over generations. So we might just leave that for now, but I think with your kids, is, is find a way to be, be fair, okay? Set standards, hold to those standards, standards but uh, you know, at points, you're probably gonna have to be flexible. Does anyone have any thoughts or questions on fairness? 
Billy, I think it's interesting to <coughs> explore the notion you'll all be treated fairly, but not necessarily equally, because that's a judgment called by the coach and on your ability to, to be the right person at the right time in our game, play more minutes or less minutes, or some people are in different circumstances. So is that an interesting, um, because in the, in the cognitive development of, of the young kids, I often don't understand that it's so black or so white they, they can't differentiate between fairness and, and being treated fairly but not being treated quite in inverted commas and equally because of the conundrum of the game, the talent development and the situational challenges that happen in the game that require different combinations. Are they able to come to grips with that, do you think? I think, and we had this conversation a couple of weeks ago, didn't we, about they have to earn the right to get to do it in the game. They have to earn the right during the week to do it in the game. So, and this is what I've been kind of playing around with now that we've started playing games is we're in a development program so we feel the need to give everyone equal minutes but it doesn't feel right because some of them aren't playing well. So I think our thing is let's provide <coughs> equal opportunities, sorry, fair, op fair opportunities, equal opportunities. So that might be, okay, you're all going to get in two or three times a game but it doesn't mean you're all going to get the same amount of minutes. If you perform well and you do what's asked of you, you'll get more opportunity. If you don't, then that's your opportunity done. That's your one of, you know, one or two opportunities done. So I think um, it, it's really important, especially, and I think that's where training time is really important, is uh, it's, that's where you give them opportunity and allow them to go against each other, allow them to go against people they think they're in direct competition with, because they'll self-regulate. So if they think, you know, well, I should be getting 10 minutes a game, but then I should be getting her minutes a game, you put them against each other in practice, they'll start realising, oh, she's a little bit better than me, so I'm going to have to work harder. So I think training time is really, really important, and that's where they have to prove themselves. Um, and then they get opportunities in the game, but they don't retain those opportunities unless they perform. So I think, in one of my last national, international uh, Opals games with Brendan, uh, I had a, we played qualifiers, we played New Zealand in New Zealand, uh, first game, yeah, first game of the Oceania, Oceania qualifiers. And um, I come off the bench, I was thinking up, I probably had one of the worst games, I had five turnovers in the first first five minutes, and uh, he pulled me off, and I basically wanted to say, don't put me back out there. I'm, you know, I'm done, I'm not performing, I get it, this is, you know, we're talking about national team stuff, I don't, Brennan, it's okay, just put me on the bench. And he, and he basically comes in the coach and goes, you know, you're going back out there. And I fully expected not to get another opportunity. So what he showed me was you will get a second opportunity and you might even get a third opportunity. But I can guarantee you if I draw another five turnovers in that second opportunity, that was it, that was me done. So you get opportunities, um, but whether you retain them is, is up to how you perform. Would you do that and vice versa with the girls? Like you say, you provide the fair opportunity to develop it during the week and then you get two or three in the game. But if they don't take advantage of the development during the week. Is that more of a natural consequence where you won't perform, so you don't call when you be it or a bit of both, and implement it where you're like, okay, you didn't take advantage during the week, and now you don't get to play. Yeah, yeah and that's like what Paddy was saying was you earn the right during practice. So forget about the game. If you don't take advantage of what you do during the week, then yeah, you probably don't get the same amount of opportunities on the weekend. And like I said, girls are, girls are smart. They'll know. They'll know. How would you handle, it's not the, the kid's fault, yeah. but the parent doesn't put a priority on the kid being there or, yeah. or value basketball and when they miss training and stuff like that, how would you handle that? That's all, uh, and we probably should have put that in here. I think we put it in a later slide, is um, create standards. Uh, it's going to come up. But then the second part of it is have flexibility. So you are going to have different kids from different backgrounds with different circumstances and it is important to, to provide that flexibility within that extended framework. Um, I was in Victoria and was really pushing, uh, not so much the girls at, the, at that point, but the boys is a really strong Sydney's community in, in um, Victoria that are, are super basketball players, but they weren't um, at this point connected to the high performance because they couldn't play for a red club. And they couldn't play for a rep club because 
by the time they get the correct look, if I'm wrong, and they get correct, by the time they hit manhood, so 15, 16, they're just sent out to, they're on their own. So they don't have a lot of parental support. So off you go, you're a man now, you get yourself to where you want to go and all this kind of stuff. So walking out, have a, have a few hundred bucks a year to, to go play for, for an association it just wasn't something they could do. And then rock up to practice, two practices, and then a game on the other side of Victoria it was tough. They just didn't have that support. Um, so I think having that flexibility, but then being transparent within the standards of it. So, yep, we're going to be flexible with you because of your circumstances, but then everyone needs to understand why. Um, and it's just that transparency because you don't want to disadvantage or you don't want them not to have an opportunity, but then you don't want these guys either to, to turn their nose up um, if they don't have that tolerance yet. So I think flexibility is a little bit... Does anyone have any thoughts? More thoughts? <coughs> Be open. Yeah, one of the kids got me <laughs> last weekend, so um, so they got stuck up on Facebook. So I was actually telling you kids that's a you know great job for being big and boxing out. One of the kids was like, "See, girls, that's how we play defense. <laughs> if that's how they play defense, and I'm doing something wrong." So um, this is a big thing. Again, Lon and I spoke about this um, over the last couple of months. Be honest and open. So, and that means positive, positively and negatively as well. So negative, we probably wouldn't use that word, but but if they're not good at something, find a way to critique them and to encourage them to, to go work on that. But they need to know what their flaws are as well as their their strengths. Because if they don't, they get to hear when the parity starts to come across the board, and they wonder, you told me I'm, I'm the best player. Okay. Well, why why aren't I scoring 20 points a game? Because it all levels out, and they haven't caught up to, to where they sit on that and how much they have to work. So be open and honest. Um, understand that females are, are very, very smart. Um, sometimes we call them clever. They, you, you say do this, and you give them the constraints or the framework. And if you've missed something, they'll they'll find it and they'll go do something else. They're very clever. Um, like we spoke about honesty, clarity, transparency, and this is what we're talking about. So if you get this dead on, you'll get a really good ego. If you go a little bit above, you get an inflated ego, a swollen ego, and we all know those kids, and, and that's great. While they're young, they'll probably go and score 20 and, and get seven picks and 10 boards, but when they get to adulthood, they'll struggle. And this is a really interesting thing that we spoke about one of our sports psych. Um, a little while ago was a lot of kids that had a lot of praise when they're younger or a lot of achievement so a lot of success they tend to steer towards having more a more fixed mindset does anyone know why anyone got any thoughts as to why and it's what they're hearing and then they believe that you know so if they're hearing it either in the school the sporting arena or at home it's it just as well that's who i am any balance of, so why do I need to try? Why do I need to do anything else? I am that. Yeah, I think um, on that point, I had a young girl once that um, a parent said she could do anything she ever wanted to do. Well, that's why mum and dad were really good. But in a team environment and in competition and national championship, it doesn't change much like that. You know? So the point that um, Lorraine made, I think, is, is really, that's what they hear. And sometimes it's really, but I think then it boils back from a coaching side to what you said earlier, that you've got to have rules, you've got to be able to be transparent, and you've got to apply them, and you've got to comply, apply them consistently. And that's, yeah. we go on. Yeah, nobody said coaching wasn't easy, no. an easy business. Because you're not a woman. No. For us, no. Yeah, yeah. And we speak, I mean, we can talk about that later too, I guess, but um, everyone says, oh, we're just coaching basketballs. And, you coach them, you give them the same content, absolutely. Give them the same content. You know, go out, try and knock it, absolutely. Um, but there are nuances between females and females. The other reason, uh, this one down here, fixed mind athletes, is they've always been praised, it's always what they've heard, they've got achievements, success, they feel pretty good. Is now, if they go and try something and they fail, it's so much harder for them. So, if they've come from that 
being that super child superstar, they're less willing to try new things because of failure. And that's a really dangerous spot to put our female athletes in. So that's why it's really important to be open, it's honest, and nobody's perfect, so you can always find something for them to work on, just as you can always find something that they do well. But it's really important that we, we don't think that we're doing the great thing right now, that you can do anything you want to, want to do, you know, you're this, you're that, you're Diana Trazi, you're Warren Jackson, right now that's who you are. We actually do them a disservice because now that's who they feel like they have to be. And that doesn't leave any room for them trying trying new things and failing. And failing is part of success. Really, the biggest danger in all of that is it doesn't attribute success to effort, hard work, and consistency in all the coaching and training and practice and values that we're trying to establish. Because they just think, I'm it, I'm it. So the effort, the reward, doesn't match. There's an incorrect attribution to what leads to success. And that's the biggest danger. Did you write this? Yeah. Uh, only, only say that because Maybe it comes up later. Um, does anyone have any more thoughts on that? Ah, oh, so, so kind of like what Paddy's saying, is striving isn't an invaluable skill. So wanting to be more. If we tell them that they're everything now, what are they striving towards? What are they working towards? So give them something to, to strive towards. It's a really invaluable skill. Any thoughts, stories? What did you do? Okay, so challenge. So these are my personal beliefs, so challenge. It's really important to, to challenge, and this has kind of been touched on another thing. So give them opportunities to be grown up, especially teenagers, maybe the young ones, probably not just yet, let them be kids, but teenagers, they, you'll see them, they seek it out. Okay? They, they want to be responsible. Okay? If you don't give them those opportunities, they will. They'll, they won't be team players. They'll leave the bags there at the airport. You know, they won't pick up the balls after themselves. And they won't help each other out, because you don't give them an opportunity to be responsible. And I think that's that's really important with teenagers. Play around with that. If you've got some teenagers, give them a little bit of responsibility and see what happens. See see what you get, and see what impact not only on them that, that comes from that, but what impact that has on their teammates from their, their responsibility. Um, and at the same time, provide them opportunities to be kids. So with kids, like we spoke about positivity. With grown-ups, uh, and even with, I'd even branch into seniors, all right? Seniors, female, would like, Rach was awesome. Rach, there was always a moment during the season where, where Rachel would just let us be kids, all right? And that's really, really important, and I would take that into program. So we, up, up at Logan, um, we come in, and we're, we're full-grown adults, so 20 to whatever, 33-year-olds. Um, <laughs> And we come up and we play invisible touch to start with, or we play rebound ball, or we play bump off. Like these games without without a basketball, and we just play and we giggle and, and have fun. And I think it's really important to create opportunities for them to be kids, right? especially young kids these days. There's information overload. They're mentally way more mature than we were when we were growing up. So I think it's our job as, as coaches to provide. And that that, in all honesty, especially grown ups. It takes a little bit of the workload of us. So instead of us having to micromanage everything, they could be responsible for something. Uh, and I think this is, like we spoke about before, I think this is really important, is that elite thinkers and performers, they actually excel under, under challenge. They actually want to be challenged. And you don't realise until you actually challenge them, they're doing it. And this was, this was an interesting one. I, when I was in Sydney many years ago, um, I did a little stint of just coaching Saturday out of Scots College um, with another 14 boys, or year 9 boys. And after my first practice, I went back to a friend that worked at the school and I said, they are ratty. I said, they don't listen, they they yell, they talk, they do their own thing, I can't get them to do anything. And he turned around and said, listen, the young boys have no morals. Just put them on the line and run. And so I did that. So I just challenged them. Put them online, do this, didn't do it, get online, we're running. Went back, do it, didn't do it, online. And just challenge them to, to do it. And if they didn't, then they got to run. Okay, that's part, obviously it's part of the voice, just running out some, some energy. Five minutes. Awesome. Um, but they will respond to challenge. Okay. 
So I think it's really important. To that. And the, the tough thing for coaches is challenging sometimes means relinquishing control. All right, so let's just hit through. So effective positive strategies, voice, really important. Allow female athletes to have a voice. And this ties into a lot of the other stuff we're talking about. Uh, do that through open questioning. Um, and then this is what we do with our kids. Like so many times our kids say, what do you think about this? And I'll sit there going, looking for the right answer. Guys, we don't want the right answer, we want to know what you think. And so the ADC kids were good, New South Wales kids this morning were great, our CIO kids are horrible. Okay, because they, they're trying to be perfect. Right? They want a gold medal and you know, they're trying to be perfect. But the trade-off, and this is really important, is they they need to listen as well. Humour. I mean, I'm, I'm sure all of you guys have a, a sense of humour in your own way. Mike McHugh said to me when I went down to Victoria, and whilst I was freaking out and being overwhelmed and all that kind of stuff, I was like, Mike, I'm trying to, like, a, you know, with people I know I've got a sense of humour, but with these kids, I just I feel like a, a cardboard cutout. And it's just like, you've got to find your way. I think for us, it's variety, fun, um, and this this one here, which is really, really important. Don't be afraid to be full once in a while. It's endearing, it's honourable, and it's relatable. The more we try and be perfect, the more they try and be perfect, and we just can't wrap what we're trying to do. More great than perfect. So this is a big one. And I won't talk to this just because we're running out of time. But if you get a chance, go watch this TED Talk. It's about coding. So you can get off track a little bit. Um, but the, the message is really, really good. So, teach our girls bravery, not perfectionism. And then some current COE strategies, open questioning. So, constantly, what you, even in a game, what's working? Are you happy with that? How's this going? What's your rating? Just getting them to talk, okay? They, they pretty much come up with the answers. Um, spoken about that. Talking about that, I may have doubled up the slide. So this is something we do at the COE. We have a take home. So during the week, they can write their thoughts, basketball or off court or whatever they want. Sometimes we're making it a little bit competitive up here. So we've got the foul shots. We've got five and a half minute threes. Um, we we'll put their free throws up, and this is stuff they come up with. So this week, um, stay switched on, smile. Attitude, do things that you can control when tired and sore. Um, intensity, good shots uncontested, extra pass, shoot if you're open, push through tiredness. Uh, you're not as good as you thought you were when you win and not as bad as you are when you thought you when you when you lose. See the good in every situation. So this is the stuff that they're coming up with. These are 16, 17 year old kids. Okay, so they know the answers, they're intelligent. Let them let them speak. Uh, responsibility. So for us, organising and sticking to their schedules, they've got AMS reporting. This is the big one that we're doing at the moment, and I'm really enjoying it, is athlete driven film review. After every game, as a team, you guys need to decide four topics that we're going to cut. They'll come back, they'll give us those topics. All right, put yourselves into teams of three, and you guys, the assistant coach and I, will compile 10 to 14 clips. They're going to come in, they'll take those 10 to 14 clips back, and they'll be three then they'll give those three clips to us, and then we'll have a film session. They've got to get up, they've got to talk to those three clips. That's the film review session. Not us talking, we'll chime in if we need to, but they run the film session. They pick the clips, they pick the topics, they pick the clips, and they talk to them. But there's plenty of things that, that we can do. And the last one is education. So show them YouTube clips, use the resources around you, the internet, you guys, local resources, each other. So, but find a way to to provide education and then get them to take ownership. So that's pretty much always a chuck slide for the, the seven teams, always. Has <laughs> 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 so anyone got finally any thoughts, questions? I know we rushed to the end of it, but. Thanks, guys.